No one can foretell the story of the 21st century, but it is a safe bet that China is going to be playing a starring role in it. Is Canada prepared for that? Yes, we have had a close and mostly peaceful relationship with our American superpower neighbor for 200 years, but we share one of our official languages and many of our most cherished values with them. China is a very different cup of tea. David Mulroney, Canada's former ambassador to China, has thought much about this relationship and talks about it in his new book. It's called Middle Power, Middle Kingdom, What Canadians Need to Know About China in the 21st Century. And he joins us now here at TVO. Nice to have you here. Great to be here, Steve. Thank you. First things first, off the top. You are related to Brian Mulroney. I think in the mists of Canadian-Irish history, but that's, absolutely. That's not the one I mean, though. What's your brother's name? Brian Mulroney. Okay, but he's not the former Prime Minister of Canada. N not the last time I checked. And let's also confirm, you're a Mulroney, and the former PM is a Mulroney. And that's uh, the, the subject of many disputes, but I'm sticking by Mulroney. <laughs> you've actually, I mean, you've had some dealings with the former PM, though, right? What was the briefing he gave you after the Gerald Ford funeral? Well, you know, when the former president passed away, I was working in PCO as the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Privy Harper's Council office. Privy Council office as Prime Minister Harper's foreign policy advisor, and I was asked to see if former Prime Minister Mulroney uh, could uh, attend the funeral on behalf of Canada. So I got him on Boxing Day. He was very gracious and said yes, he'd be honored to when the arrangements were made, and I thought no more of it. Until about two weeks later, and, and sitting in my office, in the Privy Council office, late in the afternoon, my assistant comes in and says, I've got uh, Brian Mulroney on the phone. And I thought it was my brother. And I said, look, I, I'm busy writing this briefing note, I'll get back to him. And she said, uh-uh, it's the Brian Mulroney. And I picked up the phone, and I heard that voice. And he said, Mr. Mulroney. And I said, no, no, I'm not Mr. Mulroney, you're Mr. Mulroney. <laughs> but he proceeded to give me a briefing based on the discussions he'd had uh, at the funeral with the, the world leaders who'd attended. And if you took the three or four most important issues for Canada in the world at that time, he gave me a briefing on what those key people thought about those issues. It was the most detailed thing. I remember that my arm was sore, and I was embarrassed at the end of it. I had no questions to ask. It was so complete. And I wrote a fantastic briefing note, which I attributed to him. But you know, there was a man who really thought about Canada and the world and was very gifted in terms of his interpersonal skills. Hmm. Let's think about Canada and China now. And you advocate that this country needs a China strategy. And to suggest that we need it also suggests that we don't have it. Why don't we have it? We don't have it because, and, and I, I talk about this in, in the book, um, we've been hot and cold on China over the last 10 years or so. So when the Harper government came to power, they wanted to rethink the China policy of Prime Ministers Kretschmann and Martin, and I think it was time to rethink the policy. We'd come out of the Team Canada era, the time of those massive trade missions. We needed to think of something new. That was a bit tired. But I think the uh, Harper government's reappraisal took too long. It was too public and too messy. But by 2009, he was ready to engage. The Chinese were most willing to have that happen. For about three years, we built the relationship suddenly. Then in early 2012, it suddenly stopped. And all, co all communication stopped. We got on with other business. I think we thoroughly confused the Chinese. We lost our place in whatever the pecking order is. Why did it stop? It stopped, I think, because the, the government um, of the day did a very accurate reading of Canadian public opinion. And I think Canadian public opinion, if you look at things like the Asia Pacific Foundation, which is based in Vancouver, the polling they do of Canadian impressions of Asia, you'll see Canadians are very ambivalent about China. Only about 10% have what they would call a warm feeling about China. In other words, we want the business, but we, we don't like them that much. I also think, and you talked about this in your intro, we're stuck in a way of thinking about foreign policy that, that's lodged in the past, where our key interests in terms of Canadian prosperity, the economy, Canadian security, were all worked out through our relationship with the United States. China is now capable of influencing those things, not dominating them, that's still largely the US, but influencing them significantly. We don't get to choose not to engage China. China is engaging us. And unless we respond intelligently and with intelligent self-interest, we're really going to lose the opportunity to manage our side of things. So a China strategy for you looks like what? A China strategy for me has a couple of characteristics. Um, in, a, in an earlier uh, incarnation in foreign affairs, I worked on Afghanistan, and I, I was the secretary to what was called the Manley Panel on our future role in Afghanistan. This is the former deputy PM, the John former Manley. deputy uh, PM, and, and some other very smart people like Derek Burney and, and Paul Tellier, uh, Jake Epp, who were called to and give Pam advice, was and Pam Wallen was on that too, to, to give advice to the government on um, how to really get the mission back on track. The key piece of advice for the Manley panel was that the Prime Minister had to own the engagement in Afghanistan. 
Afghanistan was very important to us, but it is nowhere near the strategic importance of China. So I think the prime minister needs to own the engagement and direct it. I, I think cabinet should be involved, and we should probably have a cabinet subcommittee that looks at not the hundred things we need to get right with China, but the three or four big things that we need to get right with China. And then I think we also need to invest a lot more in research and thinking, the Australians have already done this, about the implications for Canada of China's rise. We need to be much more aware of what's happening in China and how it's having an effect for good or for ill on us in Canada. The inference I also draw from your last comment is that if the Prime Minister needs to own the China policy for us to get it right, this current Prime Minister doesn't. Fair to say? Fair to say. And, and I think when I say own the strategy, what I mean is I think it's time to have a conversation with Canadians that says something like, we understand why Canadians are ambivalent about China. There are some good reasons to be ambivalent about China because the rise of China isn't all good news for a country like Canada. It's a challenge to some of our basic values. It's a challenge to our security. But that's not a reason for not paying attention. So here's what we need to do moving forward. We're not going to sacrifice our core Canadian values, but we are going to put in place a kind of agreements and accords that a sophisticated relationship with an important country requires. And this, you know, this is the way forward. If we don't have that conversation, if we kid ourselves that we can simply ignore it, we're really courting uh, misfortune in the, the medium term mm. to the long term. Let me take you back 45 years, because there was a prime minister who did own the China policy. He Pierre Trudeau opened up uh, relations with China before the United States did. How impactful is, in the way that China deals with us today, is that initial opening from 45 years ago? You know, uh, before going out to Beijing to serve as ambassador, I was up, you know, refreshing, trying to refresh my, my Chinese at a language school. And in my spare time, I read uh, Trudeau's book from 1960 called uh, Two Innocents in Red China. It's the book that he and Jacques Hébert, another mm -hmm. Quebec intellectual, wrote. And the edition of the book I had was a 68 edition. So there's a note to the reader from Trudeau as prime minister. And he says, you know, it's important to remember why Hebert and I went to uh, China. And that's because we thought it essential that citizens of our country should know more about China. What he's saying is to be uh, a connected, involved citizen of a country like Canada, you need to understand the world and important parts of it like China. The Chinese still remember that. They still remember it, and we're, to a certain extent, we're living off some of the goodwill that things like that Trudeau recognition, like the conservative decision to, to sell them wheat in 1960. They have long memories. But that investment, that early investment, won't last forever. Your initial brush with China, I guess, was 1986? It was uh, 1985. I 85. went out to serve in, we reopened our consulate general in Shanghai. We'd closed it after the communist revolution in the early 1950s. So we rented three houses in the suburbs of Shanghai for the three Canadians, and the fourth was our, our consulate general. And, and we, what do you remember about that China compared to the one we know today? You know, the, the, the China of then, the, the Shanghai of then, was still very much uh, a grimy industrial city. Um, they would point across the river to the place that's called Pudong, across from downtown Shanghai, and say, someday we're going to make that a, a modern uh, metropolis. And, and I'm sorry to say that I said I, I kind of doubt that. I mean, it was really a struggling city. But it had a, a dynamic mayor, a, a person named Jiang Zemin, who later became the leader of all of China and ensured that Shanghai played its place in, in, in China's development and that China itself developed very quickly. But it was the last gasp of an old, uh, uh, the last chance to see an older China mm. that now completely vanished. Where were you on June 4th, 1989? I was, uh, I had returned to uh, Ottawa and I was working on the China desk and we had followed um, the demonstrations. Uh, it, it's hard to remember now in the wake of the terrible things that happened, but uh, in the run up to the Tiananmen massacre, there had been some optimism that perhaps China might change. Uh, it was, uh, the, the demonstrations were widespread. They involved lots of people in Chinese society. And there was a thought that this could be uh, a turning point in, in Chinese history. A lot of the people I knew who worked on China, a lot of the Canadians who worked in business and media and, and academia, left the China file after that because mm -hmm. it was so emotionally unsettling to think about what had happened. It was a, it was a terrible time. Uh, and it was a time in which, when we decided to put the relationship on hold for a number of years, it really lasted until uh, Prime Minister Chrétien's Team Canada in uh, 1994. Well, I was going to say, Brian Mulroney was the Prime Minister when that happened, and that essentially our relationship went into a bit of a freeze after that? As the relationship with, with other countries did. Mm -hmm. What was important, uh, Stephen, in terms of that, though, and I, I learned a lesson, is um, there are some things that are no longer possible when you go into a crisis like that. 
but you can't shut off every form of communication. You still need to talk to big, important countries and make sure that they're not feeling dangerously isolated. I sometimes think of this, I'm, I'm not a Middle East specialist, but when I look at a country like Iran, uh, my China experience makes me think that it's probably better to have at least some level of communication with the Iranians or with the Chinese or with the Russians, as much as they may displease us, to understand what they're, they're, what they're doing and why they're doing it and to make sure that they don't feel dangerously isolated. You mentioned earlier that you served in China under three prime ministers, Gretchen, Martin, Harper. Could you compare the um, engagement on the China file that you had with each of those three? Well, uh, clearly the, the person who most enjoyed the China file was Prime Minister Kretscher, and, and you know, he, he felt that he'd, he'd put things back on track with uh, Team Canada. And, and I, and I, I want to make the, the point that they were great innovations in their day. Uh, but he just was, tell people what that oh, is. So, so Team Canada don't um, was something that uh, Prime Minister Kretscher launched in 1994. It involved some, several hundred business people, all of the premiers, this huge Canadian cavalcade that went knocking on the doors in, in Beijing and really reminding the Chinese of how significant you know, the relationship with Canada was. And it was greeted with real enthusiasm by the Chinese. But I think we carried that on well into the 21st century when um, it, was, uh, it had been done by others. The other thing I, I point out in the book is uh, I, I'm not sure that, it's the, that having the prime minister as the main uh, export promoter is the best thing because prime ministers also have to have, to have very difficult conversations about human rights and, and security issues. Probably better to have your trade minister and premiers promote trade and specific ministers and leave um, other aspects of the relationship such as the tough questions on, on human rights to the prime minister. Let me pick up on that because I, I, I presume you were in the room with various prime ministers at those moments when the inevitable discussions about human rights came up. In, in what fashion and with what tone would our prime ministers engage his Chinese counterparts on that topic? Uh, I'd say, you know, all three did uh, a, a pretty good job. You're dealing with someone who's the leader of the largest country in the world, who's come up through a, a very tough, highly competitive, somewhat brutal system. So these are not shrinking violets, and they're not afraid uh, to uh, contest a difficult issue. So it's not easy to bring it up. Um, and we but bring it, it up? We bring it up. It's and our, our side leaders brings have, it up. Our, our, our side has, mm -hmm. and, and some of them, there, there was a premier in the past called uh, Zhu Rongji, who was the economic czar. He was the premier um, that dealt with Kretschem. He was very comfortable in his you know, rebuttals. He'd say, look, here's what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. You know, we, we think we're making progress here, but not there. He was very frank, and he, w he was actually quite good with the media. Others are a little bit more wooden. Um, others are a little bit more prone to, to spouting the party line. Anybody say none of your damn business? Uh, no, no. They never said but, that. But one of the things uh, I would uh, brief uh, ministers on in particular, and sometimes the prime minister, but this more, happened more with ministers, is if they were in a session, so the foreign minister was in a large meeting uh, with his counterpart and you had uh, a dozen officials in the room, and there was a very sensitive topic that we had to raise relating to a prisoner of conscience or someone who, who needed urgent medical uh, treatment, I'd often suggest that after making general comments about human rights, they saved that intervention until the two ministers were walking into the next meeting or, or alone because you'd get a more thoughtful response if you did it that way rather than in the formal setting when the Chinese counterpart then feels in front of all of his officials mm -hmm. that he or she has to give you the party line. So how you raise it, when you raise it is really, really important. And can you actually point to cases where doing it your way worked? Yes. I, I can think of one example where it was, uh, strangely enough, a meeting of health ministers. And so we have an annual health dialogue, which is really important. And I talk about that in the book because China, first of all, still needs Canadian uh, health solutions and, and People like Bethune have been central to the relationship, the Bethune, the famous Canadian doctor who died on the battlefields in, in China. So health is really resonant. How many in, years in the ago that now? Uh, Bethune died in 39, I think. So that was okay. uh, a long time ago, but he's still revered. Very, very, he's still revered. Mm -hmm. So we had the health minister's meeting, and at this time we had a, the spouse of a Canadian who was in prison. We think he'd been beaten up by the police. Uh, and needed urgent medical tr treatment, and his Canadian spouse was worried that he wasn't getting the treatment. So we had the Canadian health minister raise it uh, with her, uh, counter her Chinese counterpart when they were walking in a, in a private session, and, and she said, and he happened to be a medical doctor, and she said, I know you're a doctor, this is important to us, could you look into this? Uh, because it's a case where you know, medical treatment is, is needed. And he did, and he said he would, and he did. Let me ask you one more thing on this, and that is about religion. Uh, Jean Chrétien and Paul Martin were uh, Catholic. 
uh, Stephen Harper, I'm led to believe, is an evangelical Christian. Uh, there was an item in the paper the other day about um, an edict going out in China to start removing crosses from places around the country. Uh, a clear slap at the progress that Christians have made in China over the years. Anybody go to bat for Christianity in uh, China on your watch? Um, you know, the, the, they have established an ambassador for religious freedoms, which is a good thing. But I don't think that that for, that ambassadorial position has been deployed as, as perhaps as actively as it should be. Uh, I took a keen interest in religious freedom, and so I used to go, I, I visited what's called a house church, or a Protestant church that's not under the official control of the party. It, it's, I had to go into a rural area and I went in to, to see what was happening because these are um, Protestants who wish to practice their religion without excessive state control. So I wanted to see what they're doing. I used to visit mosques. And I, you know, I happened to be a Catholic, and it was an interesting experience for me because you know, I've grown up in Canada, tolerant, prosperous Canada. I've enjoyed complete freedom of religion. And while I was in China, uh, the Chinese government cracked down significantly on the Catholic Church. Pope Benedict, former Pope Benedict, had tried to reach out to the Chinese, had tried to find a, a, an accommodation with them. But by 2009, they were feeling very confident in a lot of respects. So, uh, they spurned this, they put priests and bishops in prison, they made it much harder for Catholics to practice their faith. And so it was a very interesting experience for me to be a Catholic in a country where Catholics were um, under significant pressure. And um, I, I made it my, a point to also visit with uh, Catholic priests, with Catholic NGOs, uh, and to include uh, a visit to religious believers of, across the spectrum on, on all of the major travels that I did, and I, I think that's hugely important. Okay, let me take it to 10 years ago. Prime Minister of the day is Paul Martin. He goes to China, he meets with uh, Hu Jintao, and they agree that the Sino-Canadian relationship qualified as a quote-unquote strategic relationship. What does that mean? You know, that's something that is endlessly confusing in Canada. And I remember at the time, the Chinese said, look, we want to use this terminology, you should agree you should you know please you know don't don't turn us down and and i think the canadian response was well if you want to call it that that's fine but it means something in china it's really necessary to define relationships with countries so when they say we have a strategic partnership with canada that's a signal to china's vast bureaucracy that says okay we can now do things with canada that we couldn't previously do mm -hmm. so uh, prime minister martin agreed on the strategic partnership con concept but we never really got it moving we never you know, put anything behind that. It wasn't until uh, Prime Minister Harper's 2009 visit where we got that, um, we, we, we had that put back into the, the, the agreement between the two leaders and we said, let's make it mean something. Within three or four days, I had a senior Chinese official at, the, at a dinner at the embassy. This is the person responsible for international education, which is hugely important. And he said, we want to do even more with Canada, David, because we're, you know, I just heard that our strategic partnership is reconfirmed. <laughs> so part of my job was to trek back to Ottawa and say, these definitions mean things. It gives us permission to build in areas where we actually want to build, but let's do that while, you know, because relationships don't stay warm and, and, and cuddly forever. Let's build, build them while they are. Did it turn into anything more than we get your pandas and we get to coo all over them when they come over here? Did, well, you know, the, the pandas were, were kind of the icing on the cake, although mm -hmm. tremendously important uh, politically in Canada and, and the subject that I probably got most grief from from Ottawa. Why did the pandas become such a big deal? You even spent a lot of time in the book talking about panda the, the, diplomacy. Panda diplomacy was a big deal because it, pa pandas are the ultimate soft power uh, card that China has to play. Nobody else has pandas, and people are nuts about pandas. So um, I, I dealt with a correspondent of another network who used to complain to me all the time, saying, well, my network won't pay for me to travel. I'm based in Beijing, and I'm supposed to cover Asia, but I don't have any travel money, e even to get around China. And then I showed up. I was in a regional airport in the southwest near where the pandas come from, and wh whom do I see in the airport but this Canadian correspondent? I said, has your network seen the light? He said, no, I'm covering a story about pandas. And they said, <laughs> if the story has pandas in it, you can go anywhere you want. <laughs> so there's a reason for that, and the, and, and the, Chinese, the, the Chinese get that. They make you nuts? Uh, you know, you have to, you have to be practical and, and realistic. And, and if that becomes a symbol for the relationship, that's fine. But you've got to put other things you know, in, the, in the store window. One of the intriguing things about your book is that Stephen Harper's foreign minister for four years was a guy named John Baird, who's just left public life, as you know. His name, four years, that's, I think, yeah, I mean, that's one of the longest serving foreign ministers of the last 25 years, I think. His name appears in your book once. How come? 
Um, I, I was more interested, I, I think some of the trends that I saw, certainly in the, in the most recent government, were not so much personal trends as political trends. So I didn't want to uh, create the impression that we were doing things in a particular way only because of a particular person. So I talk about the tendency not to use uh, diplomats in diplomacy. I think that's part of a larger trend to sideline the public service, uh, to describe it to Canadians as mere bureaucracy, to diminish it. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Prime, uh, Minister Baird was an example of that, where so were, so were many of the other ministers in that, in that cabinet. Um, the other thing was um, it would be easier to talk about ministers if there had been a sustained uh, and I, I, I think long-term vision of the relationship. And we, I, I didn't see that. I, 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 it doesn't stand out in my memory as the Baird era or the, you know, the, I worked under Minister Cannon as well. Lawrence Cannon. Yes. Uh, well, you're kind of confirming what my follow-up question was going to be, which is you only mentioned him once because either he was so insignificant and had nothing attached to his name worth mentioning, or you and he went at it hammer and tongue so many times you didn't want to mention him, which is closer to the truth. You know, the, the truth is that I, I actually had a good relationship with Minister Baird, but I think I, I came to see that that is part of the problem, that the current government has certain people that they'll work with uh, and that's good if you're the, one of those people, and I think I was one of those people, but it's not good for the institution. So I mentioned Minister Baird's visits to China where he would, the, well, the Chinese ambassador would accompany, accompany him to China, which is a little bit unusual. And in the meetings, and in the summation for the meetings, Minister Baird would work with the uh, Chinese ambassador and the accompanying officials from foreign affairs would be left on the sidelines. That sends a very strong signal to the Chinese that foreign affairs doesn't, isn't really a player. But it's also a bad idea because it's important for ministers to get to step back a little bit, to let officials deal with the messy issues and to intervene at a much higher level. So this sidelining of foreign affairs, which was part of uh, Minister Baird's approach, but it was also evident in, in the canon years, uh, I, I, I attribute more to a government than, than to individuals. You do say in the book, the federal public service has a problem with leadership. What do you mean by that? You know, a lot of the coverage of the book is focused on my criticism, and it is real criticism of um, the current government and of ministers. But I also, first I acknowledge that I was a senior official in the public service and on China, so I can't uh, evade responsibility entirely. And I also make the point that um, the, the federal public service often fails to, to rise to truly national issues. So Afghanistan is for me the compelling case in point because I lived it. You had the Canadian International Development Agency, CEDA, which does all the humanitarian assistance. You have the, Can the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs, and in a much larger capacity, the Canadian forces all engaged in Afghanistan in various ways, and uh, supposedly together in the Kandahar mission. Much of my time, in fact, all of my time, was spent trying to get those three organizations to work together for Canadian ends rather than for the organizational ends of CEDA, Foreign mm. Affairs, and the Canadian Forces. How tough was that? It was extremely tough, and it was only after the intervention of the Manley Panel, the establishment of a cabinet committee, uh, putting responsibility in the Privy Council office, that we managed to do that for a couple of years. And so it's extremely tough. As an ambassador, I called myself the connector in chief because in the embassy, it's not just people from foreign affairs. You've got people from Natural Resources Canada, Agriculture Canada, the provinces. I think I had 12 or so departments and agencies represented. And my main job there was to get them to focus on four or five truly Canadian objectives, not the individual objectives of whatever desk was uh, pulling the strings back in Ottawa. And that was really, really tough. So the public service needs to accept the fact that sometimes they're working for Canadian objectives, not organizational objectives. Mm. Our economic relationship with China is deepening. We saw an announcement the other day that Canada and China have launched this first North American yuan hub for Canadian Chinese currency. First of all, uh, what is that and what do you think it's going to do? What it is and, and what it's going to do is it gives um, Canadian business people the opportunity to uh, denominate their, their goods in uh, Chinese currency to transfer from Canadian dollars to um, Chinese currency without first going through uh, 
U.S. currency. So it saves them, and by some estimations, it'll save them. They save six billion six, over a decade. Six billion is that dollars. Uh, I think it is possible. Yeah. So it's, that's a good thing, and it's one of the things you need to put in place uh, as the relationship grows. When when I give talks around um, the GTA or on Toronto about the economic relationship, people are astounded to see that China is far and away our number two economic partner. So it's not the size of the United States, but it's much, much bigger than our relationship with the UK and Japan and Germany and France combined. Hmm. So things like that that make the relationship a bit easier are good things. It's also part of China's desire to internationalize their currency. To, it, it's still international trade, uh, only a very small percentage of international trade is currently denominated in, in Chinese currency. They'd like that to grow, but there are limits on how much it can grow because of um, the, the fact that the Chinese economy itself is still relatively closed. So these gestures uh, are important, but it's just one of a number of things that we need to do to, you know, to keep the relationship growing. How concerned are you that China's state-run companies will come over here and buy up our you know, free private market companies, uh, at, um, which would be great for China, but maybe not, no, not necessarily so good for us? You know, um, a couple of things about that. First, I think the real action in China that we're going to see is, is no longer in the state-owned companies, it's in the private companies, which, and they tend to be a little bit smaller and, and maybe more nimble. One of the things that I spent a lot of time doing in, in, in China was working with the companies that were most likely to invest in Canada and getting them to focus on how you do business in Canada. So we were lucky sometimes if they would simply take off the shelf their how to do business in the US book, and that wasn't enough. So we said, you know, in Canada, uh, provinces matter, municipalities matter. Uh, we're very sensitive about the environment and uh, labor rights and, and labor uh, safety in the workplace. Our north is important to us. And the smartest and best Chinese companies got that. Others, you know, fumbled a little bit uh, coming out of the gate. My own sense is that Canada's always depended on foreign investment to, to grow its economy. The largest source of foreign investment growth is, is probably coming from China for the foreseeable future. So we need to figure out how to work with China as Australia and, and Europe and, and many, many, many others are doing. But at the end of the day, we have to have faith and we have to apply our own Canadian regulations. And uh, we shouldn't lose heart uh, or assume that there's something that the Chinese can do to, to overturn those. If we apply our Canadian laws and regulations in a society where we've got a, a lively media, we've got NGOs, um, I think the Chinese, like most foreign investors, will find that it's a good business environment as long as they, as they play by the rules. So I'm, I'm confident we can do that. This country, of course, has a North American free trade agreement. A couple of years ago, we got a free trade agreement with the European Union. Last year, we got a free trade agreement with South Korea. Free trade with China? You know, the Chinese in, in 2012 began to float this idea, which is really uncharacteristic for them. They normally make you come to them and, and pay three or four times for the privilege of opening discussion. So the, the, we were clearly um, in their good books. My sense is it, makes, uh, it, it would be a good idea to, to begin sitting down with the Chinese to talk about this. We don't have to negotiate a bad deal, but uh, free trade negotiations do a number of things. One, it, it forces both sides, but the Chinese in particular, to think of the totality of the Canadian economy, I including not just the resource sector, but you know, our um, engineering, financial services, um, health care, uh, food, uh, food and beverage, a much broader sense of what Canada is all about. It also has the effect of raising exporter interest in the other economy. It, 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 people become much more aware of what the possibilities are. So I think it's actually a good idea. Uh, I wish we picked up on that in, in 2012. I'm not sure when uh, we'll next have the opportunity to begin those discussions, but I think it's, it's um, essential for our economic growth to have a much closer economic relationship with China. Here's uh, from your book. We need to be willing to stand up for values that China is now challenging. Our sympathy for China's very different culture and history should not lead us to abandon belief in the universality of basic human rights. Okay, I get that, but would you agree that China seems to be doing just fine, thank you very much, without paying any heed to our concern about universal basic human rights? You know, it, it's an old saw that it, it kind of depends on your perspective and timing. And um, if you look at China year by year, it doesn't seem to be changing very much. If you look at China over decades, it is changing. And it's changing in part because of what it hears from outsiders, 
but also changes because of the uh, pressure and ideas and energy of people within China. I call these people constituencies for change. I met lots of journalists who know what journalists do around the world and wanted to be good journalists. They don't go to work wanting to be bad journalists. They don't like that. Mm. I met lawyers who know what lawyers do and understand rule of law and wanted to be the best lawyers they can be. So part of our effort has to be to reach out to these people, to remind them that you know there's a wider world out there that cares. I'd like to see us doing even more, for example, between law schools and journalism schools and, and more exchanges. Uh, to encourage that process of, of change and evolution in, in China. You think we can influence their behavior towards our direction, our way of thinking? A absolutely. You think so? Absolutely. And, and I think we are seeing that now in China. It's always, you know, it's often one step forward and, and two back. But that's no reason not to, uh, not to engage in that. Mm -hmm. and, and there are smaller individual cases. Because you can say, well, what good does our activity on behalf of individual dissidents do? My colleague, the German ambassador, used to tell me a story he would send cards to a particular dip, uh, dissident who was in prison. And he said, I often felt silly doing that because I thought, that's all I can do. When the gentleman got out of prison, he said, you wouldn't believe how important those cards were to me because it reminded me that someone out there uh, hadn't forgotten me. So we used to visit the families of dissidents and we'd bring them toys for their kids and, and you know, we'd go to their court cases. It's really important to, to keep those discussions up. And you're not doing it gives the Chinese a sense that uh, it's okay and that there's a free mm. pass. David, let me ask you one last question, and that is you having seen authoritarian capitalism up close, and you of course being Canadian and living in a democratic capitalistic society, who's gonna win? I, I, my own sense is that the Chinese model will continue for uh, at least the short to medium term, uh, and let's talk about five to seven years out, but I think they are in for uh, significant pressure because the authoritarian capital, capitalist model um, ultimately runs out of steam. The Chinese since the terrible crackdown in Tiananmen Square in, in 1989 have basically focused on economic progress and so the, the message to Chinese people is we're going to give you your condo and your one child can go to university and your life can be better. But not your but, freedom. But not your freedom and uh, they, they've also failed to face up to uh, political reform. So the ultimate question facing China, the existential question facing the Communist Party is about rule of law. And that is, what is the relationship between the party and the law? Is the party simply the font of the law, above the law, or is it subject to the law? So they're mounting a major anti-corruption campaign right now, which is very, very popular. But th they can only let it go so far. Because at some point, the party is then forced to investigate itself which becomes very, very difficult. So I, th I don't think those problems and those questions can be put off forever. The key questions about rule of law and about the relationship between the party and the Chinese people are, are coming due. And they're coming due within the next five, to, I think, to seven years. And if China can slowly and carefully uh, address them, the way forward looks pretty good. If they continue to stonewall on that, I think there's a very bumpy road ahead. Middle Power, Middle Kingdom, what Canadians need to know about China in the 21st century. That's our former ambassador to China, David Mulroney, not to be confused with Brian Mulroney, who's been our guest. Thanks so much for visiting us at TVO. Thank you, Steve. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.